Welcome back to my dad's podcast, season two, My Black is Transnational. Follow him on Twitter and Instagram. Hope you enjoy the show. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of My Black is Transnational. My name is Dr. Kalechi B. Lambert and I'd like to thank you for joining us today. On this episode, we are going to have a guest who will be joining us um, talking about food uh, and, and his business when it comes to how we sustain our cultural food here in America. So I'm very excited about this guest that we will be talking about today. Uh, my interview with Mr. Boye Sobitan, um, based in Chicago, the founder of, the co-founder, I should say, of Oja Express, um, which is an upcoming business in, uh, uh, that, that really focuses on providing authentic groceries um, for those who miss their traditional home food um, and trying to provide those goods here in America. Um, but before we get into that, let's go through our formalities. If this is the first time you're listening to my Black is Transnational, you can follow me at Black Transnational underscore on Instagram. You can also check out our new website, blacktransnational.wixsite.com slash podcast. If you want to get more information about everything that has to do with this podcast, you can also check us out on Twitter. We are starting to pick up the speed on Twitter at MB Transnational. And if you just want to send some feedback, you can find this podcast on any of your favorite podcast listening apps, and you can subscribe, you can rate and review the podcast. We really appreciate your reviews, your feedback. It's very helpful for me and the rest of the team as far as making this podcast better for you. So now that we've gotten that out the way, again, this interview that we're going to be having on this episode is a very exciting one, Mr. F- Mr. Sobitan and I get to have a nice little conversation about just how he started this and how his transnational experiences influenced him to want to be able to provide indigenous products and 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 food products that remind people of home and why his business Oja Express is going to be the leader as far as creating that what he calls the United Nations essentially of providing food for immigrants in the diaspora who really want their um, traditional food and want to sustain their cultural diets. So I thought it was a very exciting conversation that we had, and I hope that you enjoy it too. Please make sure to contact us if you have any feedback or just share your thoughts about what you hear um, on this show. So without any further ado, here's my interview with Mr. Boye Sobitan about Oja Express. Enjoy. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to My Black is Transnational. And today we have on a special guest on the show um, from a company that I've been very fascinated with for years. As a matter of fact, I talked with this brother uh, about th- three years ago um, about this company, uh, Oja Express. And uh, I really just love what it stood for. And it really aligned with my interest and fascination with, um, with just connecting to home cultural preservation and the whole transnationalism. And so we have on Mr. Boye Sobitan, who is the co-founder of Oja Express, which is a mobile ethnic grocery delivering company. And I'll stop there because I want to introduce him to you. So welcome to the show, man. No, man, thanks for having me, man. Thanks for having me. Yes, uh, it's a pleasure. So, man, if you could just give our audience, our listeners, just a couple minutes to just let us know you know, who you are and wh- your, what your company is and what, what it stands for. We'd love to hear that. No, oh, definitely, definitely. So again, my name is Boyd um, Shobiton. I'm the CEO, co-founder of Aja Express. Um, and simply put, Aja Express is a grocery delivery platform seeking to um, pretty much serve the immigrant and foodie um, foodie demographic, um, exposing them to and connecting them to their cultural foods. Uh, we saw like a void in the grocery delivery landscape, where a lot of ethnic communities don't really see themselves represented. Um, in those landscapes, so we decided to take it upon ourselves to uh, pretty much um, shorten that gap 
um, everybody uses Amazon, everybody uses some type of delivery service because, you no, know, we're busy, especially if you're a millennial or younger, you're moving around, you're doing a lot of different things, but you still have that taste of home. <laughs> Even though right. your parents might be from Africa, Jamaica, what have you, you still, you still know what quality home cooked authentic uh, food is. Yeah. Um, and, but, but going to those stores are not always convenient. So we developed a platform that pretty much enables consumers who seek fat, who want to, you know, cook their cultural foods and have access to a grocery store they used to go to go to with their parents on Saturday mornings, um, access to those stores. And we also help the stores um, by putting those, those products on the platform because a lot of these stores don't necessarily have the technology infrastructure or the time mm -hmm. to kind of maintain a website and to kind of do this kind of e-commerce style of business. So it's kind of a two-sided market that we're helping both the consumers connected to the stores all through cultural foods. Man, that's that's fantastic, and I, and I love the fact that I think you're appealing to more more than one generation because I think you're appealing not just to those who used to go to the stores and you know go with their moms to what old world market, especially you know in Chicago and places like that, and now you're also appealing to another generation, a mobile generation that is very busy and, and but still want that taste of home. So when when did this start? Like what inspired this? I know you mentioned there was a gap, but like how did it just become something that you were like, man, we have to move forward with this because this is a this is very critical. So basically um this idea started several years ago, right? It was the idea was sparked a couple of uh, maybe around twenty fifteen or so. Mm -hmm. Um, when um, I was with a friend, um, he's a physician who I stay at home mom, and she uses another grocery delivery service for their kind of staple groceries like chips and you know regular what I consider like Western groceries. Mm -hmm. But she still has to cook her jollof rice, sorry, way do all her you know typical Nigerian groceries, and she kind of was lamenting on how she you know she would have to pretty much just kind of just like go out of her way to these stores, which are not always convenient. If you're a bit some of these stores, if you don't, especially if you are, are driving from a distance away, mm -hmm. um, they're not always convenient to get to. And the custom experience is not always that great, depending on the time you go. So I'm like, okay, I got, there got to be a service out there. There's, there's an app for everything. Uh, this is where there's an app for that <laughs> kind of came from. Yeah. So I searched and I realized there was no app or service that was kind of delivering those products. And it kind of automatically put me back to my undergrad days where you know, I was in school at UIC mm -hmm. and I was one of the few uh, kids in the African student organization that had a car on campus. So every time I would go to like the old world market, everybody would put their order in and say, hey, buy me this, buy me that, buy me this, buy me that. Right, right. Um, so, so I was thinking about like, okay, well, let me see if we kind of do this in the digital age. This is when everybody wanted to kind of be an Uber of everything. Mm -hmm. So I met with my co-founder, my, my today co-founder, and I kind of pitched him on the idea. And then um, he, being himself, he's a developer, and you know, developers get asked to you know, join teams all the time. He literally made me go back and do some more research to kind of convince him. So I did it, came back, and then probably about 2016, we launched. And we've been bootstrapping a Josh Press ever since um, out of our own fund to really um, – make this uh, a service a reality so that no immigrant or foodie will ever feel you no know, too far away from home with regards to the culture of groceries. Yeah, no. And I think, and I think you all have been like moving at a rapid pace from, you know, from launching for three years. I mean, just looking at what you all are doing lately, um, you all have really expanded as far as your customer base and uh, you, what your background, you're, you're Nigerian, correct? Yes. All right. Correct. All right. So now, do you, what your customer base? What does it a, a appeal to? I think you mentioned like Jamaican. Uh, do you cover all African groceries or the majority of it? What what groceries? A majority of it. A majority of it. We, we we're trying to grow more. So if, if you're if you're an audience and you know a grocery store <laughs> that needs that needs to be on our platform, um, email us at info at uh, So no, we try to do a majority of it. Um, primarily, our, our primary customer customer base right now are pretty much West African and Caribbean. Okay. Um, uh, it makes sense. There's a lot of cultural similarities in the foods. Uh, a lot of similar foods might be prepared a different way. Um, so, um, so yeah, that's pretty much our, our, our customer base now. But we're also adding. We just had a, a key meeting. We're going to be adding a number of uh, Latinx grocery stores, wow. a couple of Indian grocery stores. So our overall vision is really to become the United Nation of groceries at your fingertips. Nice. So any groceries you're looking for based on, on on religious affiliation, if you're Muslim or or you're Jewish and you have dietary restrictions, or or if you're looking for a, a unique spice from South Africa or whatever the case may be, you should be able to find it on our app once we kind of get everything really really, really rocking and rolling. 
That is fantastic. And I mean, this is, and it was exactly how I envisioned you all working because I, I think at the time we had initially talked probably two years ago, I had just published a paper that talked about the importance of um, traditional food in African and African immigrant homes as far as potentially reducing hypertension and long-term, long-term diseases because a lot of these foods are prepared at home. Uh, you have a lot more control. Fresh. You know, they're fresh, right? So they're, they're fresh. They're uh, organic. They're, 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 a lot of them use leaves. Exactly. I mean, there's meats and there's, they're, they're definitely oils. Um, but there, there's a, there's a, then also there's another level of the mental aspect of it as well, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, imagine being thousands of miles away from home, like, you know, not having access to the food that you used to be able to just go downstairs or go outside into the middle of the compound and somebody's preparing, right? Yeah. yeah. So there's that level of, of, of comfort because being away from home, that, uh, that homesickness could be, uh, a very anxiety inducing. Mm-hmm. And assuming you've been here for a while, even if you've been here for a while, even if you grew up here, imagine some of the things that your parents, uh, made you eat when you grow up and you didn't want to eat like oh let's go to mcdonald's ah, we have you no know, tandayana at home you know what I'm <laughs> yeah as a kid you, as, as, as a kid that might have been frustrating but then when you get older and you realize like you know you miss it yeah. like well i do want some pounded yam i do want some goat meats i do want some jollof rice you know what i'm saying yeah so you have to value so you value those things yeah and I think that's important because when we get, you know, when the oh, our, you know, our parents when they come here and they may not be as tech savvy as our generation, but I think, you know, going to the market and you know buying those products, we used to eat those foods at home, even though we were here in the United States. You know, they, our parents were very averse to just always eating McDonald's, always eating these Westernized foods. Like I know my mom to this day probably has never been to like Subway, right? Like she's never been to a lot of these fast food restaurants because all she wants is African food. And I think a lot of other um, Nigerians or just West African and even Jamaicans and other African immigrants really have that strong desire to want to continue to eat their food because if they if they stop eating that food, then they, they kind of lose a little bit of that identity that they really you know, align with, and they don't want to lose their culture. I'm, it's important. Food is I mean, a big part of culture. Take, 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 take it another step further. I mean, when we, when we look at research from an anthropological standpoint, yeah. food is actually the last vestige of any culture that's actually shed. Mm-hmm. Usually people change the way they dress, the way they talk. Um, they do the language after a while, but food is something that is, sticks with you. Yeah. you know, that, that, that food tells the story of a, of a people. Yeah. It's culture, right? Yep. These are food that, that generations among generations of ancestors have prepared and have sustained them, mm-hmm. you know, through various stages of of, of, of human um, development. So when you when you're talking about food, it's one thing to talk about the the, the natural abilities of food. Okay, I'm, I it gives me energy. I can go through the day, et cetera, et cetera. But then you if you take another step further, which I'm not sure I'm not sure if a lot of people do. When you think of those further, you can think about, yo, my great, 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 great grandfather was eating the very, very exact same dish. Yeah. Might be prepared differently for the technology, but the same dish is what they were eating too. I mean, that's mad deep because you think about how it's been passed on for years and years and years. And maybe how it's changed is just a little bit of a modification here. Maybe we try to find a healthy alternative here. And And speaking of healthy alternatives, you know, we're in this day and age now where everyone is very health conscious. Everyone is very, you know, wants to try to find ways to continue to calorie count and things of that nature. Obviously, with traditional ethnic groceries and foods, sometimes there there's some things that may be heavy in the starch, heavy in the oil and all that. But has that been something where you all have kind of thought about how do we try to also in our marketing and promoting, try to share like healthy alternatives to your traditional dishes or is that something that you just well we're just here to deliver whatever you want well we can deliver whatever you want but there's also other other sites for example uh nigerfoodie.com mm-hmm. shout out to nigerfoodie we worked with them in the past they have a losing nigeria diet plan which is pretty much the same thing that we eat but prepared differently in, in moderation like for example like you don't need to have a mountain of eba in front of you in order to eat it right. make it like the size of your fist you know what I'm saying, yeah. and consume that. Or if you don't, or if you don't want to eat it, by change it with you no know, uh, whole oats and use that. So there's different modifications you can use. Use olive oil. Um, use different less salts. Like you know, what I'm saying more pepper. There's a lot of different things that people can do mm-hmm. um, 
to modify it. So, but we're not in the business telling people how to prepare their food. We could definitely, you know, connect people with the resources. We just want people to have access to them to begin with. Let's start with the access before we start talking about modification. So, or we can talk, or, or, or we can talk about it in parallel, which I think is also fair as well. No, I mean, I think I think it's the starting with that is probably the first step. Um, so then, what about your experience? I want to talk a little bit about your experience. Were you born here or were you born in Nigeria? I was born um, in the U.S. Okay. Um, so, but uh, uh, very, very Nigerian parents. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure my parents were amongst uh, many of other parents that came here in, um, in the early 80s. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, I, I, I like to say my, my experience in the U.S. has been an experience of duality. Mm-hmm. Both um, like at home being Nigerian <laughs> and in the U.S. trying to assimilate to uh, Western culture. Yeah. I mean, that's the transnational experience right there. So then, like, what is, how often do you go back to Nigeria? Well, this year I've been back twice. Nice. It might be a third time. So, so is it for pleasure or business? I try to go back often. Okay. So what? Is it for just for just to go home, or is it for because of the business? I, I, business at home, all of it, it's interactive. Like, yeah, I, I can't just go on. I, I've never been the type of person to go on vacation just just chill. I always got to find some type of opportunity, or someone to talk to, learn some different things, meet some different people. So it's all it's all mixed in together. Okay, okay, yeah, that, no, it's always good to go back home. They're just, I mean, it's, you know, the groceries and everything is cool, but sometimes I think there's there's something about a prepared meal back in Nigeria or back home that just oh yeah, hit, oh yeah, it hit oh yeah, bro. you know, it it hit come real suya. It hit different. Come suya with the with the with the with the, with the house I'm in, the, the mall I was preparing. Yeah, them. it hit like, there's different. something different about it. They just get in like this kind of off the rack suya with the suya, no, this the steak with suya pepper on it. It's, yeah, it's a little bit different. It hit different, man. I I I miss it. Yeah. And um, yeah, or, no, get it, or you're getting grilled, getting grilled or fried croaker fish and, and dipped in, in with all the pepper and the pepper oil. It's yeah, different. oh man, <laughs> or some bully. When you get some bully and you yeah. with the ground nut, oh man, yeah, that, those are good times, man. And and I'm even I'm even sitting here, I'm talking to you. I got a I got a whole roll of digestive cookies because that just reminds me of being in Nigeria because they don't, you know, I need to settle in London and everywhere else, but it's just a key no, cook and, biscuit and, themselves. And, 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 and we have it, and we have that on our on our platform. Digestive yeah. cookies. We have uh, cabin cookies. We have all those different things that people use for provisions back in boarding school. Yeah. So Indomie, the real Indomie, the Niger Indomie, the one that comes like, in the you know, box. The, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we have we have all those things um, because again, it, it, like you said, when you you think about it, you automatically it puts you in a, it put, gives you a memory yeah. automatically right, of of of, 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 a, of a pos- hopefully a positive experience. Absolutely. So then, now, okay, what about your your interactions with those who are like not African immigrants? Because you did have that sense of duality, and you mentioned trying to acculturate to the U.S. But what was your interaction with African Americans, and how was it perceived? How were you perceived when you were growing up compared to now that you? own this business and you really try to appeal to different types of foodies do are do you do you serve a lot of african americans or or not like what's how's that like but funny enough we, funny enough uh, most of our non-african non-native eaters have been white really? <laughs> have been more and i'm not sure if there are others more curious or more adventurous mm-hmm. uh probably uh, both of those are probably true mm-hmm. Um, so, but what the, the, a lot of the, our African American customers that we've um, have served have been people who are married to Nigerians or Jamaicans or Trinis or Ghanaians or what have you. Mm-hmm. So those have been where most of those customers have come from. Um, they you know experienced it, or I think we got a big bump with the whole Black Panther. You know, you no know, Wakanda right. forever. Right. Everybody wants to all of a sudden people want to know what's about jollof rice and things of that nature. So, yeah. so that has been that. So we we hope to grow that. Okay. And we hope with more cultural exchanges, uh, more intermarriages, things of that nature, you're going to start seeing a lot more food blend. But even when you look at the history of a lot of African-American food, a lot of it has like roots in Africa mm-hmm. as well. So we don't always highlight those things. So um, so we that's, some, that's an opportunity for us to kind of do more of. Yeah, because I was thinking about how what were ways you all were thinking about connecting with that is that something you all want to do and i think you kind of answered it already because i do think and i've always been pushing i always mention it anytime i talk with anyone that i i believe that in order for us just as a black community we got to start finding ways to bridge that gap because i think there's a gap that's created between both both populations that is slowly trying to bridge but i i just feel like food should be the best way to bring everybody together you know so 
Um, yeah, yeah, Flu should be the best way to be America, I, and I definitely agree with that. Um, I, I think that that gap building is a two way thing. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, I think the opportunity, but I mean, you see it now. I mean, I went to a party the other day with your love rice with fried chicken and, and um, fried chicken and um, um, mild sauce. If you're from Chicago, you know what mild sauce is. Yeah. So like you just you starting to see that. Jollof rice and mild sauce, or jollof rice chicken? Like they didn't no, put the no. mild sauce on the jollof rice because no, no, that's no, rude. Chicken. No, 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 no. Don't, don't disrespect. No disrespect. No, it's more so like it's more so jollof rice. The meats was the chicken. Gotcha. The chicken had the mild sauce. Got you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no, jollof rice and mild sauce. Like I said that's rude. Yeah, I had to lose my I had to lose my passport that. for that one. Okay. <laughs> um. Yeah. So I, I. I mean, I think just just hearing this, I'm I'm excited. Um, and I think you all said that you are partnering with different types of stores. So do you normally have like drivers just, you know, get an alert like like Uber? They, there's an app that they use and then they deliver the groceries or um, how do people like continue to like, you know, keep the business growing? Yeah. So like, again, um, very, very similar to um, what you mentioned, the stores get the order. They put the order together and then there's a driver that's alerted to pick up the order to go to a particular address. Okay. So, um, so the reason we did that was because people want to know and trust where their food is coming from. So, like you, you mentioned, Old World Market, for example, people know what to expect when they get Old World Market, right? Mm-hmm. And you want know someone who knows, you know, how to cut meat and do those different things that mm-hmm. people want to their, you know, for their foods. So you don't want to kind of leave that to chance. Um, so you want someone to and, and, and to just get like people in specific ethnic groups to be shoppers limits our labor pool. So we decided to let the stores do that because they could kind of control the quality, control the process, and we have a, uh, somebody pick it up to deliver to the customer. Oh, okay. Okay, nice. And and then are you planning to try to do something like this? And I know this may sound a little off, but are you trying to do something like this in like in like London or like uh, are you going to try to you know continue to spread the business in Nigeria because it's mobile? Right. So, what do you? Yeah, yeah, about that? yeah. We definitely, we definitely, we definitely want to. We definitely want to be everywhere where everybody from any different part of the world needs their food. So, I can see us using this as a way for people to shop for, like, and there in Nigeria to shop for the European groceries while in Nigeria. So, we can see those different things. Uh, we hope to. Um, there's a number of companies in London. Um, I think uh, I don't want to name any, shout anybody out. Um, yeah. <laughs> but there's a number of companies in London that are already there. But we really want to focus on the U.S. and Canada right now okay. and then go okay. from there. I think that makes a lot of sense because I was going to say, like, London, England is so dominated, you know, with Nigerians. I wouldn't be too surprised if there was competition there. But I do think that the market is heavy here. I mean, the market is not heavy here. Yeah, I mean... Uh, yeah, the market's not heavy here, but also uh, I think there's a density issue because everybody's in London. What about people who live like in you no know, in in Scotland and Wales and mm-hmm. those different places, Facts. which well should all make up the UK. So I think we have definitely have a population advantage here in the US with so many different ethnic groups and a way bigger country. Um, so there's a bigger. I think there's an opportunity here that doesn't necessarily exist in the UK. Uh, with all due respect to, you no, know, definitely uh, the huge density of Africans and Caribbeans that do um, live in the UK. Do you also do you see yourself, um, your company having any competition in the next couple of years, or do you think you all will be the monopoly? Um, this competition, there's no such thing as a monop- a true monopoly. Okay. Um, of course, there's going to be people who are going to come in who might think they could build a better mousetrap, and we welcome it. Okay. Um, but there's going to be people who are going to probably see different weaknesses and try to exploit them, and that's what competition. That's what business is. Business is business. That's why there's so many. That's why so many times when people uh, make references in business, they always use sports because it's very similar. It's competition. Survival of the fittest. Yeah, that's facts. Um, and then finally, I know that you all are like, I saw on the on your app and the and the website that you all were like doing things to kind of promote more like community stuff. As far as like, I saw you all were like giving out tickets, like Burner Boy, and like I see you all are trying to do more things to kind of engage your. Um, your, your your consumer base. Uh, what are some other things that you all are planning to do to just continue to get people to feel more connected to Africa, you know, other ways other than just delivering food? Yeah, I mean, I, I, w- I would say stay tuned. Okay. I would say follow us on um, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Uh, we have surprise announcements. Sometimes we have a giveaway that we don't really announce. We, we Sometimes one of our customers, we deliver the groceries, we decide, okay, this customer, give them this. Just because they were the 12th customer to order, and they got tickets to like you know an exclusive private boat party, so um, so the ways to do that is if we have your information, so you are, you're a customer of ours, uh, or you follow us on social media, um, and then we kind of have those surprise pop up giveaways. 
Fantastic. Well, yeah, man. Um, boy, thank you so much for just your time and contributing to this interview. This has been fun, man. And I honestly just have to mention on air, I'll mention it. I definitely will love to continue to just, you know, work with Aja Express, especially from a research standpoint and a health standpoint, because I really do think when we talk about dietary acculturation and, and people really trying to resist it now because we have the tools, I think you all can potentially be a very uh, important vehicle that can help researchers and help truly understand what makes Nigerians, Ghanaians, J Jamaicans, West Africans, East Africans who really crave home cooking, what makes them different as far as like hypertension and diabetes and obesity? Like, is it y'all or is it, you know, other factors? And I think you all can really be an instrumental piece. So I really do commend what you all are doing because we mentioned already how important food is. And, um, and I definitely look forward to what you all have um, in the upcoming future. Right, right. And I appreciate it. Thank you for having us again. Uh, follow us on all our social media. If you just type in Ajax Express, we're not hard to find. Um, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, also, share. Uh, we have a lot of content we, we put out there for people to share. Uh, if you're not in your city now, we will be soon. So definitely, we definitely take recommendations on some of those high-performing stores that we want to make sure that on our platform that are recognized and people have access to those, those grocery stores inventory. Because one thing that we didn't really mention is how um, with the proliferation of technology, it's put a lot of pressure on these stores to compete. And some of these stores are going out of business because they can't compete. So uh, we want to make sure that these institutions uh, remain viable. Absolutely. And that's OJA Express, right? Yep. All one word. All one word. All right. And I think you all also have a YouTube page. You all should check that out. They have a YouTube page if you want to see some of the other conversations and things that they're doing as well. So yes, Boye, thank you again, man. Um, it's a pleasure. I hope to have you on again soon when you all are doing bigger and better things, which should probably be like tomorrow because you all are growing that fast, yes. man. Yeah, that's the plan, man. Hey, man, we accept it. <laughs> Peace out, bro. All right, brother. Thank all you. Right. Peace. Thank you. So that's going to conclude our show. I'd like to thank our guest, Mr. Boye Shobitan, for joining us and talking about Audra Express. Very excited for what's to come in the very near future. If you liked what you heard on today's episode, please make sure to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. It's available on all platforms. If you want to know more about past episodes or you're interested in being part of the show, you can visit us at blacktransnational.wixsite.com slash podcast. You can also follow me on Instagram at blacktransnational underscore. So until next time, I'll be signing off. My name is Dr. Kalechi Bay Lambert. My black is transnational. And I hope by the end of this, yours will be too. Peace.